book of Jonah. Now, the book of Jonah may be a little hard for you to find. There we go. I was making sure the lapel mic's on. And so if you open your Bible to the, to the middle of your Bible, you'll hit the book of Psalms. It's right in the middle of your Bible, right in the middle of the Old Testament. And then you need to go forward several books. Just keep looking and you'll find the book of Jonah. If you come to the little book of Obadiah, you'll find Amos. And then Obadiah and the book of Jonah. If you hit Micah or Nahum or Habakkuk, you've gone too far. Or if you've hit Matthew, you know you've gone way too far. All right? This is where your concordance becomes a good friend. You say, Pastor, I have no idea in the Bible where I need to turn. Well, in the, one of the front pages of your Bible, there's what's called a concordance, a, a table of content. And if you look in that, I'm trying to find mine here, you'll find in the table of contents, You'll find the book of Jonah. It's on page 1008 in my Bible. Anyway, not sure if that helps you with your Bible. I think they, ought to, they should number all the Bibles the same. That would make it pretty helpful, but they, they don't. We're in the book of Jonah tonight. And probably if I were to ask you, one of the Old Testament prophets, probably one of the prophets that would come to mind would be Jonah. We know him not so much for his message, but we know him for what happened to him and his manners, and all the great things that fell out on him. But in the Bible, you say, Pastor, why did God put all the people in the Bible? Well, God put them there for a reason. There's a purpose. Every person is in the Bible on purpose and for a purpose. Sometimes it's to give us a good example, right? I love a good example. To see what faith looks like. To see what courage looks like. To see what sacrifice looks like. To see what godliness looks like. Good things and good people. Now, that's not the only things in the Bible. Sometimes in the Bible you'll find people that aren't good examples. And you'll find people that are bad examples. And sometimes you'll find people that are even good people going through bad times. Or even bad people going through bad circumstances. And so you'll find good examples and good things in the Bible. You'll also find examples of... Bad things and bad people. God wants to give us a warning. Listen, it's, you better understand in this life, you're going to find both. You're going to find good things and good people. But in this life, you're also going to find bad people and bad things. And so we need to be aware of them. I trust by now you found the book of Jonah. And in Jonah, we're going to begin reading in verses 1. And we're going to read verse 1 and verse 2 and then verse 3. And that's going to give us where our, our, for our text for tonight. And tonight I'm going to bring a message to you, what happens when we run from God? What happens when we know God and we know God's will, but we decide, foot on you God, I'm not going to do your will. I don't care, I want to do what I want to do. A lot of people are doing that right now. What do we expect? What happens when that happens? Notice we, with me in the book of Jonah. Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, and so Jonah was a prophet. Understand that God would speak and God had a message and God had a, a, a purpose and a plan for this man. He says, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. God pays attention. Listen, friend, in this wide world, wicked world of sin, God's he's watching. Don't, don't think it's escaping his very observant eye. What's going on around the world? Listen, what's going on in your heart and my heart? That their wickedness has come up before me. But notice here in verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah was running from God. What happens when we run from God? It's a good question. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this evening, and Father, as we prepare our hearts for communion and the observance of the communion tonight, I believe this is appropriate message because there are times when we are not what we ought to be. We're not where we ought to be. We're not what we ought to be. And God, we, we know you, and, and God, we know what you want, but yet, Lord, we're drawn away. And God, we find ourselves separated from you. Lord, that's not a good place. 
So Lord, help us as we look into the scriptures tonight. And God, I pray that, Lord, if this is applicable to any of our lives in here, Lord, tonight I pray, dear Lord, that you would speak to us. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Help us to prepare our hearts and our minds and our spirits, Lord, to observe the Lord's Supper tonight in Jesus' name. And amen. As we look into the Bible, we, we see us. God says in the Bible that, that these are they're, they're examples. Sometimes you'll find the word example in your Bible. It means a pattern. You're going to find patterns in your Bible. And what we see in the book of Jonah, we see a guy that, that knew God. How many of you guys would say, uh, by the virtue of the fact that I've been raised in church, I've been raised in a Christian home, and, and I've come to the place where I've put my faith in Christ, I know the Lord. Would you raise your hand tonight? Would you raise your hand? Not, great, wonderful, all around the room. So you know the Lord. So this is us. This is, a, this is not somebody that didn't know God. This is not somebody far off. This is somebody that was of the people of God, of the family of faith, Listen, that, that listened to God, and he was a spokesman from God. He was a servant of the Lord. And yet something happened that drew him and he made the decision to run from God. So listen, understand that at some point, if this is not you tonight, this is going to be, this is going to be you or some temptation that you're going to face, that I'm going to face. At some point in our life, this is going to be us. And Brother Jonathan, if you'll bring up the, the graphic tonight, if you notice up here on the screen, uh, he was in Israel over here. And then the Bible says he went down to Joppa. Now God said, go to Nineveh. About 550 miles over to the east, he had to go uh, up into what would be the Assyrian, the the country of Assyria. Jonah lived in the uh, the northern country of Israel. And more than likely around the city of Nazareth. Who else was born and uh, come from Nazareth? Jesus came from Nazareth. And, uh, and God says, I want you to go in this direction and give them my message. Well, here's the problem. Here's the problem was, see, Assyria and Israel were not getting along. All right, They were, they were competitive. They were warring nations. And Jonah, by the virtue of the fact that he was a prophet of God, he had an understanding from the Lord that, listen, one day the Assyrian people, the people that were in Nineveh, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, they were going to come all the way over that 550 miles. They were going to encamp around Samaria. And listen, they were going to destroy it. They were going to do a lot of, a lot of damage. There were going to be a lot of loss of life. There was going to be a lot of problems. And Jonah said, not them people. I mean, anybody else, God, but I'm not going to them people. Ever feel like that way? Who's those people? You know, one time we were all those people. Can anybody say amen? Thank God for the grace of God. So Jonah, the Bible says, went down from to Joppa, and he got on a boat. And listen, he was going to head to Tarshish. Now, that's on the outer coast, the far western coast of Spain. That was the end of the world. All right, I want you to understand that to the, to the Jewish mind of this day, that was it. That was as far as you could go. As far as they knew, the, you just, the world dropped off somewhere. They had no idea. But that was as far from God as he could get. And that was his plan. Jonah said, you know what, I'm going to get in a boat and I'm going to go to the end of the world because I've I got a, a good feeling God's not out there at the end of the world and I'm going to just get away from this, this responsibility. I'm going to get away from this call. I'm going to get away from this weight. I'm going to get away from this burden. I want to get you this picture of what Jonah was planning to do. Thank you, Brother Jonathan. You can go back to the, the, uh, the other screen. Jonah was running from God. And listen, friend, while we like to think of ourselves as all put together, we like to think of ourselves as spiritually mature. Listen, friend, I don't know what it's going to be in your life or what it's going to be in my life, but there are times where God asks us to do that something that we don't want to do. Can I get anybody say amen right there? Uh, at least I'll say as a pastor, there's times and duties and responsibilities that I'm called upon to do in my Christian life or even places of devotion or sacrifice or things that God calls me to do and, and it's, a, it's, it's a level up. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stretch of my faith or it certainly draws me out of my comfort zone and it's something that I'm not excited about doing or something that I'm not even sure I'm on a how to do. This is where Jonah found himself. He said, God, that's not what I want to do. Those are the people I don't want to go to. God, they don't deserve your grace and mercy. Listen, none of us deserve God's grace and mercy. Can you say amen right there? And so Jonah boards a boat and he sails off into the Mediterranean sunset with the 
warm breeze behind him. And he thought, wow, it's all going to be good. Well, what happens when we run from God? Well, the first thing that happens is that for a time, things seem to go okay. He makes this plan. He makes this decision. No, God, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do this. Notice with me in Jonah in chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa. So he left his town. He went down to Joppa. Listen, there was no lightning strike. All right. God didn't kill him along the way. And the Bible says that he found a ship going to Tarshish. He had to die. I'm going to Tarshish. And he was like, hey, you going to Tarshish? You going to Tarshish? And he said, oh, I found a ship. Hey, and he said, praise the Lord. I found a ship going to Tarshish, going my way. And the Bible says, and he paid the fare thereof. He had the money. He pulled the money out and just, hey, he had it in his bank account. He paid the fare thereof. The Bible says, and he went down into it and to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. May I say, when we run from God, sometimes we're waiting for the lightning bolt out of the sky. And it doesn't come. And we, we go to step, uh, from step A to step B to step uh, C to step D. And, and, you know, for a time, it seems like we got away with it. Like, okay, the lightning's not coming out of the sky. The fire's not coming down and consuming. You know what? I, I think this is going to work out. But please understand. Please understand when we run from God, there is not going to be in God's graciousness, in God's mercy and love, the fire that falls from heaven and consumes you in the middle of the highway. All right? Please understand when we run from God, many times things are going to go okay. And let me add a little phrase. For a season. But then we come to verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. The Bible says, And then were the mariners afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship, and into the sea to lighten of it. But Jonah was gone down in the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Secondly, I want to point out this. Sometimes when we run from God, we can convince ourselves of a false peace. Listen, everybody else was freaking out, by the way, if you're ever on a cruise and the storms get a little rough and, and, and the crew starts to get nervous and put their life jackets on, that's when you'd be afraid, okay? As long as the crew's cool, you're cool. But when the crew is starting to bail out, that's when you know things are getting serious, all right? Number two, sometimes when we run, with, run from God, we can get a false peace. We can, can, we can lie to ourselves in such a way we can believe our own spin, Someone once said that we are self-swindlers. We are very successful self-swindlers. We can convince ourselves of our own lie, even though it goes in the face of everything we know to be right and true. So number one, sometimes it, it'll go okay for a while. Number two, sometimes we can convince ourselves, have this false peace, like, oh, I'm okay. But number three, the third thing that happens is we find this. There's no place to hide from God. When we run from God, one of the things that we're going to find out is that there is no place to hide. Hold your hand here in the book of Jonah. We're going to come back. I want you to go back with me to 1 Kings. 1 Kings in chapter 8. First and say you have 1 and 2 Samuel, and then 1 and 2 Kings, and then 1 and 2 Chronicles. But in 1 Kings, and, and go with me to chapter 8, Solomon is dedicating the temple. And Solomon makes an insightful statement. By the way, when we're done here in 1 Kings, we're going to go to Psalm 139. Some folks like to get a little head start. It takes them a minute or two. But notice with me in 1 Kings, and chapter 8, and verse 27, where we see this insightful statement. Look at verse 26, and he says, Now, O God of Israel... Let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou spakest unto thy servant David. But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, the heaven, and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house which I have builded. 
You see, when we run from God, one of the things we're going to find out, first of all, things go okay for a little while. Sometimes, Then number two, when we run from God, sometimes we can convince ourselves of things that aren't so. We have this false beast. But one of the things that we discover when we run from God is there's no place to hide. Listen, friend, God is so big and God is so huge. Listen, he says, not, not only can the earth not contain the Lord, but the heavens can't contain him. In the heavens of heavens, listen, friend, in all of the expanse of the universe, the Bible says to us, reveals to us that when God measured out the universe, he did it with a span of his hand. It's about nine inches between your pinky and the top of your thumb. That's called a span. And when God uh, measured out the expanse of the universe, billions and billions of light years, God said to eeny, meeny, jelly, beanie. All right? Listen, friend, understand that God is so big and God is so huge that, listen, not only can the earth cannot contain him, but there is no place to run. There's no place to hide from God. Go with me to the book of Psalms, Psalm 139 and verses 7 and 8. As the psalmist here in Psalm 139 is struggling with sin and issues, in Psalm 139, begin reading with me in verse 7, he says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Talking about the presence of God. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, uh, uh, if I say surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. And the darkness and the light are both alike, unto, alike to thee. What happens when we run from God? If you go back with me now to the book of Jonah. I put a little bookmark in there to make that faster for me. I hope you did (laughs) Did that as well. What you're going to find is that there's no place to hide. I don't know if you've ever had the experience, but sometimes little kids like to go and hide, right? They go and hide in the house, but they're hiding in the house, right? They haven't quite figured out that they're in the house, all right? And I remember maybe hiding from mom or hiding from my sister, or hiding from uh, mom and dad. And, and the thing was that I was in the house and there was no place in the house that I could go where my mom or my dad couldn't go. It took me a while to figure that out, all right? But listen, one of the things when we run from God, this is what we're going to find out. There's no place to hide. There's no place that God's eyes do not see. There's no place God's hand cannot go. So listen, friend, when you and I run from God... Understand there's no place to hide. We're back now in the book of Jonah. And we've learned, number one, that things seem to go okay for a time. Number two, we, we've learned this, that sometimes we can convince ourselves and get a false peace. Number three, we've learned that there's no place to hide. But then look at verse four. The Bible says, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. The The fourth thing that we find when we run from God is we meet the correction of God. Friend, when you and I run from God, one of the things that eventually you and I are going to for surely run into is we're going to run into the corrective hand of God. You know why that is? Because God loves you. Because God loves me. Listen, God loves you enough and God loves me enough Not to allow us to get away with the faulty thinking that we've pulled one over on God. Not to allow us to go off in self and sin and can I even say stupidity to the point where God, listen, where we convince ourselves that we won. Listen, God is too righteous, God is too good to allow us, his children, to go off uncorrected. Please understand, when God brings correction, it is for, listen, our good and his glory. Understand that God is not the mean old man upstairs with the big hammer that's just ready to whack you on the head every time you get out of line. That's not God. God is a good God. He's a loving heavenly father. He is wise and kind and good and right. And listen, everything that God does, he does for our good and his glory. And God manifests his goodness to us by not allowing us to go off into self and sin and stupidity 
uncorrected. We find that when we run from God. Listen, friend, God is very clear. He says, be sure your sins will find you out. He said, listen, there's nothing that's done in the darkness that he's not going to bring out in the day. There's nothing that you and I do in secret that God is not very intimately, fully aware of. That thought ought to be very sobering and very straightening to you and I. It ought to affect what we watch on our phone. It ought to affect what we uh, consume on the television. It ought to affect what we uh, put into our ears and into our eyes. Listen, friend, everything that you do, everything that I do, everything we see, everything we desire, God is very well aware of. And when we run from God, listen, friend, at some point, God is going to bring his corrective hand of judgment. In fact, we're going to get into a little bit later, we're going to be going to the New Testament book of Peter. If you wanted just a little bit of a head start, we're going to be going um, to, um, uh, to, I'm sorry, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, but not for a little while, not for a little while. But we're going to, fr- we're going to find out and we're going to conclude this message with what does God intend when he brings his correction? We're going to get that of that in just a moment. But when we run from God, we find, we, we meet his correction. Now, I want to po- point out just a couple quick things here on the way to the conclusion of this message. But notice with me in Jonah in chapter 1 and verse 6. So the Bible, and the Bible says, So the shipmaster came to him and said, said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise and call upon thy God, if so it be that God will think upon us that we perish not. One of the things that we discover when we run from God is that our sin and our suffering affects others. Our sin and our Suffering often time affects others. Listen, no man is an island. No woman is an individual person. Listen, friend, you and I, everything that we do, we are interconnected with the people around us. And one of the things that we're going to find when we run from God is, listen, to my decisions and, and my actions and my attitudes. And when God is dealing with me, many times it splashes over onto others. Please be very aware. You want a good reason to walk with God? You want a good, be a good reason to walk and live and, and have a life devoted to God. Because listen, friend, when God sends the storm into your life, it doesn't just come into your life. Many times we bring others with us in and through the storm. When we run from God, one of the things we find is that it affects others. I want you to notice here in verse 15, Genesis, uh, Jonah, Jonah in chapter 1 and Notice with me, the Bible says here, so in just briefing the story, what happened is they're, they're rowing and they're praying and they're, they're trying. And Jonah said, listen guys, God's in this and God's trying to get a hold of me and I'm running from God. And understand there's going to be no solution until you get rid of me. And so he said, listen, throw me overboard. Let's get it over with. Notice with me as we pick up in verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased her raging, from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let me bring out the next truth here. When we run from God and we meet the corrective hand of God, it's going to get worse than we ever think. Not only are others going to be affected in that process of God's correction in our life, but understand this, everything you do, everything I do has an effect on others. But friend, I can guarantee you in Jonah's wildest dreams or nightmares, when he went down to Joppa and he paid the fare thereof and he thought he was going to have a nice uh, uh, cruise out to Tarshish, In his wildest dreams, he never thought that there was going to be a divine tempest whip up in his life. And in just a few short hours, he's going to be cast into the raging Mediterranean Sea in the middle of the ocean. Listen, and then a fish was going to come up and swallow him up for dinner. And he was going to marinate in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. Listen, friend, when you run from God, you mark her down. It's going to get worse than you ever imagined. Jonah would have never imagined he was going to end up as Bob, bobbing through the Mediterranean Sea, okay? He never ended up that he he would be a snack for the whale, and he'd be sloshing around in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. But listen, friend, that's what happens when we run from God. 
And all of this brings us together to the final thing that I want to point out from this passage. And we're going to jump from here over to Hebrews. But notice with me in Jonah in chapter 2 and verse 1. What do we find when we run from God? The Bible says in, in chapter 2 and verse 1, then. You know what that then was? That was then. That was after God brought his corrective hand after others were affected by his sin after it got worse than he ever thought it would be possible lower than he ever thought he'd be taken down greater suffering and sorrow and separation than he ever could have imagined then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly when we run from God it's to bring us to a decision see Jonah had to make a decision See, all of God's corrective hand is to do this, is to bring us to the decision of who's in charge. See, God gave Jonah a job to do. He said, Jonah, I got a job for you. I got a message for you to deliver to the Ninevites. He said, you go and preach the preaching I bid unto you that 40 days and 40 nights, if if Nineveh doesn't repent, Nineveh would be overthrown. God was going to rain down fire and destruction. That was the message he was delivering. Jonah said, no. God, you're not in charge. I'm in charge. You don't tell me what to do. I tell me what to do. And Jonah ran from God. And all of these things that he found along the way brought him to this place. The same place that you are brought to, the same place I'm brought to, is a decision. Listen, Jonah in the belly of the whale had the same decision that you have and I have. Who is going to be God? Who's God in your life? Who's God in my life? Who's the one that ultimately makes the decisions and gives the orders? Either the decision is this, friend. Either you and I, like Jonah, wisely, correctly, smartly say, Okay, God, I'm tapping out here. (laughs) Okay? I'm done. I'm good. You got my attention. I'm ready to listen. That was the decision Jonah had to make. Now Jonah had another decision. He could have just been digested. And he could have just been a little whale indigestion along the way. Jonah had a decision. Listen, if God did not intervene in this man's situation, he was going to die. So the decision that God brings us, what happens when we run from God? All of it brings us to a decision. Are you and I going to allow God to be God and decide our direction? And we will conform our life and our will and our desires to him. Or are we going to ball our fist and clench our teeth and slam our fist and say no? That was a decision Jonah faced. Literally, it was a life and death decision for him. Typically, it's not that bad for us. Typically, it's just a spiritual life and death decision. Can I just say to you tonight, along the road of life, the road of life is strewn with spiritually dead Christians. That they were on the road of life, they knew God, they loved God, they served God, and then all of a sudden, something didn't set right with them. Something wasn't to their liking or their satisfaction. It certainly brought them out of their comfort zone. And they said no. And they ran from God. Listen, and God brings his corrective measure into their life. Whatever that may be. But it brings us all to a decision. And friend, I know him. And you know him. Spiritually cast away Christians. Christians that are no longer in church. Christians no longer in their Bible. Christians no longer living for God. Christians who are no longer have anything to do with God. They're literally just a castaway on the road of life. Spiritually dormant. Having decided that they would rather do their own thing than listen to God. Friend, that's a a dangerous place to be. So what does God intend for us when he brings his correction? Turn with me now to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews and chapter 12. Hebrews in chapter 12, and with this I close. The book of Hebrews is towards the end of the New Testament. Hebrews, and 
you know, T- Timothy, and then Titus, and then Hebrews, then James. With me to Hebrews in chapter 12, the whole chapter, we're going to look at the first 11 verses, deal with, con- in, in context, understanding the struggle of life, because we all struggle. We all struggle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We all have the struggles inside, we all have the struggles outside, and then we meet the correcting hand of God when we go off track. What does God intend for us to understand about this decision? Because all of us are going to be brought to that decision. Am I going to listen to God, or am I just going to do my own thing? Notice with me in Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to read verse one, starting in verse 1, but we're going to pick up our text in verse 5. The Bible says this, wherefore? Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. These are the heavenly witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That's the, a picture of the Christian life. They're cheering us on from heaven. So says, listen, cast away the weights that's slowing you down. Get rid of the sin that's uh, tripping you up. And where do you put your focus? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. By the way, you were the joy. I was the joy. When Jesus looked at you and said, I see that man, that woman getting saved, getting right with God, being in a right. He said that was the joy that got him through the agony of the cross. Look at verse 3, the struggle against sin. For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. If you think you have a hard time, imagine the patience of Jesus. Ye have not not yet resisted unto blood, striving against what? Sin. The context of this passage is understanding the struggle against sin and getting out of the will of God. Notice with me in verse 5, For ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto us as unto children. He says, My son despise not thou the chastening or the correction of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Let me give you just quick six very quick things from this passage. Number one, when God brings his corrective hand, don't despise it. Don't get angry at God. Understand he is doing a work for our good and his glory. Number one, don't resist. Don't get mad at God. Listen, you're the one that got out of the will of God, not God. Amen? Number two, notice with me in verse six, for whom the Lord, what's that next word? Loveth, he chasteneth. The word chastening means to correct. Every parent that loves their child will correct, nurture, guide, mentor, and instruct their child. He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Number one, we're not to despise God's correcting. Number two, we're to understand it's a sign of his love. When God corrects us, understand he's saying, I love you enough to help you to be what you need to be. Don't look at it as a part or a sign of God's hate or God's anger. Understand it to be an evident token of God's love for you. He loves you so much, he will not give you over to your own self and stupidity. That's the second thing. Notice with me, also in verse 6, it says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chastened this. The third thing we find here is we're to expect his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. We are to, number three, expect his correction. You can expect, listen, if you're in the family of faith, if you're a child of God, expect that when you and I run from God, when we get out of his will, he is going to bring his corrective hand of, correct, uh, uh, of, of chastening. Friend, listen to me. I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned for those people who name the name of Christ and can live completely contrary to Christ and they never experience the correcting, chastening hand of God. God says, listen, whom I love, I correct. We can expect it. Notice with me in verses 7 and 8. He says, for if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons, meaning illegitimate children. Listen to me, the fourth thing that God wants us to understand is that when God brings his corrective hand of judgment, it is an evidence of your salvation. Listen, many of us struggle, especially when we're going through sin, to say, am I saved? Am I really saved? Do I know that uh, if I'm saved, would I think these thoughts? If I was saved, would I say these words? If I, if I was saved, would I struggle with these struggles? Listen, and God brings us correction, and God reminds us. Listen, correction is to remind us, hey, you're in the family of faith. 
One of the things we're to understand by God's correction is this, that it is an evident sign not that you're lost, but that you are saved. Because you're in the family, God is dealing with you as his son. Notice with me in verse 9, the, uh, the sixth thing. He says, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? The sixth thing, that, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the, six, the next thing is this, is that when we uh, uh, understand God's correction, we are to willingly embrace it. We're to willingly embrace God's correction. We're to say, whoa, God, you know what? You're right. I'm wrong. I got out of your will. I got out of your ways. And God, I see that you've brought this into my life. God, you're trying to get my attention. You're trying to bring this correction so I'll get back close to you and restore my relationship. Lord, I I don't run from this. I don't resent this, but I embrace this. And we run to the Father and not from him. Lastly, in verses 10 and 11, the Bible says this. For verily, for a few days... Uh, who for they barely for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure but he this is God why does God correct us for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness now this is an understatement in the Bible now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous and every kid says amen right there but grievous nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby Lastly, it should, it should build within us a heart of gratitude that he is working for our spiritual growth. When God brings his corrective hand of judgment upon us, we should not only embrace it, but we should thank him for his working in our life to draw us back to himself. Why don't we do this? Why don't we close our eyes, bow our head, close our eyes and bow our heads tonight. Tonight I'd like to give a A twofold invitation. Maybe that you've come tonight and under the sound of this message, or maybe you're just aware of the fact that you've never been in a right relationship with God. You've never come to the place or not yet opened your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never asked Him to forgive you of your sins. You've never been made a part of the family of faith. Maybe that's become very obvious to you tonight. Maybe the Lord is speaking to you that you need to be saved and you need to be forgiven. If that's you tonight, can I just invite you to understand that God loves you. He doesn't love or approve or condone your sin, but He sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross to forgive you of your sins. And He is willing to become your Heavenly Father And he is wanting to forgive you. If that's you tonight, would you, just in the quietness of this moment, would you pray a prayer to the Lord? Would you say, dear God, I'm sorry for my sins. Dear God, I I know I I need to be forgiven. God, I, I know I need Jesus to forgive me. God, I don't understand it all, but I know I'm a sinner. And God, I know I need to be forgiven of my sins or I'm going to die and go to hell. And God, I don't want to die and go to hell. God, the best I know how, I put all of my faith and all of my trust in Jesus who loved me and died on the cross for me to forgive me and to save me and to take me to heaven when I die. God, I'm not trusting in me or this prayer, but God, I'm trusting in you and I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins And God, to be my Savior, God, I'm asking this in Jesus' name. Maybe tonight there's some in here, and I'm not asking for hands to be raised tonight. This is between you and God. But maybe you have recognized through the preaching of this message that you're going through a season of correction. You've not lived as you ought to have lived. You've not obeyed as you've ought to obey. And friend, we've all been there. We've all been through these seasons. But can I invite you tonight to have an honest, frank conversation with the Lord? To ask Him to to freshly forgive you? Would you embrace the correction process and say, Lord, I know you're working to bring me back to yourself. Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. And God, I need you tonight.
In just a moment, we're going to have the musicians play and have a time of invitation. If you're a parent, we invite you to go ch pick up your child from the nursery so that they might join us for communion. But let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. And Father, we ask for your help. Lord, each of us, all of us, at some point are Jonah. We all are drawn away by our own lust and we're enticed. And God, we pray. We ask you to forgive us. God, sometimes we're just stuck on being stupid. Sometimes we're just in the depths and the grasp of sin. But sometimes it's just the lies of society and we just get sucked into the tide and the current. And God, we find ourselves far, far away from a father who loves us. And Father, we ask your forgiveness tonight. We ask, oh God, that you would cleanse us and draw us nigh. Thank you for being a good God. Thank you for being a loving Heavenly Father. Thank you, O oh God, you do not allow us to, walk, to run away uncorrected, but God, you show your love and your fatherhood to us by bringing your corrective hand of judgment. Lord, I pray tonight as folks need to pray and seek the Lord and prepare their heart for communion, I pray that they would follow the leading of your spirit. And Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. And amen. We'll stand this evening.